Nikki, his brother Justin, Justin's children, his girlfriend, Asia. And all who left him are victims of a system that has been unwittingly designed to fail them. At our nonprofit, the National Shattering Silence Coalition, where I'm the coordinator, we hear tragic stories like this every day from family members either desperate to get help for their loved ones, who hit a stone wall at every turn, or those who've already lost their loved ones to a jail cell, homelessness, or death. Justin's family tried for years to get help for him. He was caught in that revolving door families know all too well. In and out of hospitals, in jail, never really gaining access to meaningful, life-sustaining treatment. In Justin's case, the voices in his head became so overpowering, causing him to commit a horrific act he never would have been capable of doing in his right mind had he been able to retain treatment. Those with treated serious mental illnesses, and I don't like that term either, we call them serious brain disorders, or what, what we call, it, it, for short, SBDs, are no more likely than anyone else to become violent if they're treated. However, as we've heard other people say, when untreated, they are four times more likely to become violent. For example, 29% of all domestic homicides are perpetrated by someone with an untreated SVD. I almost became one of those statistics, one of the family members killed. It took 13 years of pushing bureaucratic boulders up mountains, only to have them come crashing back down on us to finally gain treatment for my son. During that time, my son went missing. I rescued him from a religious cult. He was jailed twice. He was homeless. He was beaten up by seven police officers in Burlington, Vermont, to within inches of his life. He was hospitalized 43 times. Yes, I'm the one that John referred to with the, the biggest number, 43 times, before I could finally get him into Maine Progressive Treatment Program. When my son was very ill, I became the object of his aggression because I was the one trying the hardest to get help for him for an illness that, by its very nature, made it impossible for him to know he was sick and needed help. You really need to take that in. It was hard for me to take in. It took me several years to really understand this was not about denial. It was not. My son has a genius level IQ. He's the smartest person I know. He's the most gifted, amazing, loving, gentle soul I know. But he simply cannot see that he has this illness. He thinks he's a shaman. He, he can't see it. Please, please try to grasp that. It's really important. Half of those with schizophrenia, as John pointed out, and 40% of those with bipolar disorder suffer from anosognosia, and I'm, and I'm not gonna rehash um, the definition. I think John did a great job with that. It's basically they don't know they're sick and they don't know, know they need help and therefore will never ask for it. My son is one of those people and Justin is one of those people. Justin should never ever have been brought to this point. Justin should have gotten the help he deserved. He never ever would have hurt his brother in his right mind, ever. He tried to help his brother. He took him in. Assisted outpatient treatment, or AOT, is compassionate care for those who have no awareness of their illness or are too sick to manage treatment on their own. It is not coercion, as disability rights might make you think it is. They are not coerced into this. They are, they are a, a, a team is, is, is um, named, a treatment plan is written, and it's brought to a judge who orders the person into treatment for a period of one up to a year. They have a choice. 
they can either follow the treatment plan or if they decompensate, they will be brought back mercifully to a hospital where they can be restabilized again and brought back out into the community to, to be able to live their best lives. And this happens before they become a danger to themselves or others. This is the only illness I know of on God's green earth where you have to become dangerous before someone can help. This type of early intervention has been found to be highly successful in states where it's utilized, resulting in 77% fewer psychiatric hospitalizations. That's 77%. We wouldn't even need those, high, those hospital beds if we could get these people progressive treatment. 74% fewer homelessness. We all see them, they're everywhere. They're all over our streets. They, they can't get help because no one will help them and now they're homeless. 83% fewer arrests. All those people who used to be in, in asylums, they're all in jail now or they're homeless. 87% fewer incarcerations. It is what saved my son's life. Since 2013, he hasn't seen a hospital bed except for two very short stays for medication adjustment. Former Senator Peter Mills, Governor Mills' brother, and John Nutting, my dear friend, along with many passionate family members, myself included, worked so hard to make the PCP program available here in Maine. Tragically, however, our PTP program is extremely underutilized, with very few mental health professionals or family members even knowing it exists. Ask anyone working in the mental health field or law enforcement or the family members. They all agree the system is broken. It's why we're losing mental health and law enforcement professionals at alarming rates. Who would want to work in a profession where those they serve are doomed to fail? Our system is designed to fail them from the top down. We must wait for someone to become a danger to themselves or others before we can even attempt to access treatment in a system sorely lacking treatment services within our communities crisis services, hospital beds, and housing that heals. But there is good news. We know a lot more about these illnesses than we did almost 60 years ago when the IMD exclusion became law. And it, was, it became law, I believe, under good intentions. They wanted people to, to be able to live in the community However, A, they didn't know very much about these illnesses. There was only one drug available at the time, and I think that was chlorine. And they never, they never wound up providing the community services. So now, fast forward 60 plus years, we have so much more knowledge of the brain than we did then. We know that these are neurological brain disorders. We have many medications that can restore people's lives. These are, as I said, these are biologically based, no fault brain disorders. We have great success in treating these illnesses, but only if we can gain access to treatment and gain that access as early as possible. Because like John said, the longer you allow someone to remain desperately ill and psychotic, the more gray matter they lose, the more their brain is damaged. My son is a great example of the success we can have. He is an accomplished musician who lives independently in the community. He is his niece's and nephew's favorite uncle. He is well loved by so many people who don't even know he has a brain disorder because that's how successful his treatment was when we could finally get it. So let's together take action and fix this. Governor Mills, this is for you, and I hope that you're going to get this message. Let's follow New York Mayor Eric Adams' lead 
and start working toward getting these people off the street, out of our jails, and out of our families' home where they're untreated and into treatment. It's time to start providing compassionate treatment, housing that heals, and the PTP program before they become dangerous, not after. So we can build a world we, where we can all thrive and give all the care that we as humans deserve. Governor Mills, our children and grandchildren, your children and grandchildren all deserve so much better. They deserve to be able to access treatment for what are no-fault brain disorders. They deserve to be able to live their best lives. Their families, who suffer right along with them, deserve so much better too. Let's not what, let one more precious soul be taken from us far too soon. We will no longer stand by and watch yet another generation of our youths be wasted to illnesses that are treatable. It's time to step up and bring these people compassionate treatment instead of allowing everyone to continue to just step over them, turning a blind eye and their backs on them. It's time to prioritize their human rights to treatment, to dignity, and housing that heals. Please, and this is to disability rights, well as everyone here. Please remember that being in psychosis is not a right we need to protect. It is an illness we need to promptly, compassionately, and effectively treat. We would not leave our grandmother suffering from Alzheimer's, wandering around the street in the dead of winter, would we? We'd go out there and we'd bring her to someone who could help her. My son was found walking barefoot in the snow down the middle of Sanford. Not a single person stopped to help him. No one. I know you must have a heart, Governor Mills, for those with serious brain disorders and their families, given that you have firsthand experience with your own brother who suffers from a serious brain disorder. Please, let's go after this problem together and fix it with the same passion and gusto you did when you got us through the COVID pandemic. This is no different. This is a humanitarian crisis glaringly visible in our jails, our streets, our families' homes, our hospitals, and our graveyards. And it's only getting worse. The cost of not caring for these people far exceeds what it would cost to actually care for them, both in terms of taxpayer dollars and especially the extraordinary loss of precious, precious lives. Let us help you. Family members know both the problems and the solutions. We've experienced the pain firsthand. Learn from us. Please, let's talk. Thank you for your time.